From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. The big news in Washington today really is about that second day of the confirmation hearings for Judge Amy Coney Barrett before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And as we expected, one of the very important subjects being discussed is the role of precedent and whether she would be willing to overturn precedent. For more, we welcome now Professor Tara Reed Grove of the University of Alabama Law School, an expert in the federal judiciary and the role of the Supreme Court. So, Professor, thank you so much for being with us. One of the issues, as I say, is a, a question about it's clear she might want to take the law in a different direction, but how fast would she go there? How much would she be bound by precedent? And we have two very different examples in front of her, both conservative. One, Chief Justice Roberts, who is an institutionalist, doesn't want to move too fast. On the other hand, Clarence Thomas. Do we know which camp she falls into, if either? So we obviously don't know for sure, but my prediction is that a Justice Barrett will move very carefully um, and will pay a lot of attention to precedent. That is something that Professor Barrett focused on a lot in her scholarship. She cares deeply about precedent and cares deeply about the institution of the court. And I think for that reason, too, I don't think she would be inclined to move the law very, very far, very fast. At the same time, in some of her writings that I've gotten a chance to look at, uh, she has some skepticism about majoritarian rule, if I can put it that way, that she thinks that when Congress passes a law, it just shouldn't be that, okay, the majority wants that, but we should look at it because it interferes potentially with individual rights. So I think that's right, but I also think that that in and of itself is a very commonly held view by a lot of different individuals. Now, depending on who we are, we care about different types of rights, but I think all of us would like to have a federal judiciary to protect our individual rights from interference from the majoritarian branches. Um, then we debate about which rights should be most protected by the judiciary and which things should be left to the political, political process. And does this apply uh, to statutory rights as well as constitutional rights? Because clearly we know we have a Bill of Rights to protect us against majoritarian rule when it comes to the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, the 4th Amendment, the 5th Amendment. But what about when it's a statute that the Congress has passed? So I think that many members of the U.S. Supreme Court right now, and I think a Justice Barrett would, be, would fall into this category, care tremendously about the words that Congress has passed. They, they adopt what we call a textualist interpretation of federal statutes. And I think Ju Justice Barrett would, a Justice Barrett would very much adhere to the text of the statute. That means if, if done properly, a textualist will either, uh, will read a civil rights statute broadly. Um, so we can look back at Justice Gorsuch's opinion in Bostock versus Clayton County, this was the Title VII case that involved whether Title VII protected the LGBTQ community. And Justice Gorsuch, to the surprise of many people, said, well, yes, it does. If you look at the text of that statute, it protects against discrimination because of a person's sex, and said that means it protects people who are discriminated against because a man who is discriminated against because he is romantically attracted to men um, or a person who was discriminated against because she transitioned from male to female and says that is covered by sex discrimination. And this was not a decision that was divided along political lines um, by Democratic appointees and Republican appointees. And I, I don't purport to know what Judge Barrett would say about that particular statute if she were on the U.S. Supreme Court, but it does suggest that textualism does not lead a justice to reach necessarily conservative or necessarily progressive outcomes. Which, Professor, I think leads us to her uh, taking issue, I think it's fair to say, with the Chief Justice of the United States, Just Chief Justice Roberts, in the Affordable Care Act case. That's the subject of a lot of the discussion right now in this confirmation hearing. And it tends to be that senators think, well, you're against or you're for the Affordable Care Act. As I understand it, the issue she had with Chief Justice Roberts was not for or against. It was what the statute said. Right. So the Supreme Court in NFIB versus Sebelius, this was the big case involving the Affordable Care Act from 2012, the court said the individual mandate could not be justified under the commerce power, but could be justified under the taxing power because it was effectively a tax for individuals who chose not to buy insurance. And what a number of commentators have pointed out, including Judge Barrett, is that well, the statute itself didn't say the words tax. The statute said the words penalty. And so as a matter of statutory interpretation, it's a bit of a stretch 
to call it a tax. Um, now there are there are reasons one can one can do that. Um, Supreme Court justices often try to interpret statutes so as to find them constitutional, and Justice Ro Chief Justice Roberts was invoking that what we call a canon of constitutional avoidance. But on the pure text of the statute, it was a stretch. And I think many commentators, both people who support the Affordable Care Act and people who oppose the Affordable Care Act, recognize that it was a bit of a stretch on the statutory reading. So, Professor Grove, bring that forward to the here and now. As I understand it, if, in fact, Judge Barrett becomes Justice Barrett, uh, one of the first cases she'll sit on is actually the Affordable Care Act coming back up, something that the senators are talking about, saying maybe you should recuse yourself. At the same time, that issue about whether it's a tax or a penalty has been decided. That's done and gone. Isn't the question now severability? Do we have any sense of how she might rule on that? So we do not have a sense. There are several several issues that could come before the Supreme Court in that case. One is whether the plaintiffs had the right to sue at all um, once, once there was no longer a tax for them to pay, um, in, in a 2017 statute, Congress zeroed out the tax and said, you can either purchase health insurance or pay zero. Um, so one question is, can someone sue about that when you no longer have to pay a tax? Um, and then another question is, is there a constitutional power for the individual mandate now that there is no longer a tax? And even if there is not constitutional power for the individual mandate, the final question, as you noted, is what we call severability. And severability involves when the Supreme Court strikes down a provision of a statute, does that mean the rest of the statute has to fall? And I think there are significant hurdles for the challengers on all three of these potential claims. And I think the biggest hurdle of all is the severability claim. I think it is, it will be very, I, the justices will be disinclined, I think, and not just a Justice Barrett, but other justices on the court right now. I think they will be very much disinclined to say that if one provision of the Affordable Care Act goes down, the entire hundred pa hundreds of pages of statutes um, have to go down as well. Finally, uh, Professor, uh, putting aside how uh, Justice Barrett might rule in any individual case, as you look at it, do you think her addition to the Supreme Court might actually shift the way the court rules, not in terms of yes or no, but in terms of its approach? The way, for example, I think it's fair to say Justice Scalia did shift the approach of the court with respect to textualism, originalism. So I think you are right that Justice Scalia shifted the court to a focus on statutory text. Um, and I actually think this was the single most important aspect of Justice Scalia's jurisprudence, even though a lot of people focus on his approach to the constitutional, his, his originalist approach to constitutional interpretation. I think the biggest change that he, he made was getting the rest of the judges on the court and also the rest of the judges on the lower federal courts to focus on the text. And a big question after Justice Scalia passed away is whether that would go away, this focus on statutory text. I think that Judge Barrett, um, previously Professor Barrett, is very dedicated to textualism. And I think her presence on the court will very much encourage the rest of the justices to focus on the text of statutes. And I think it will also make the court pay even more attention to history um, when interpreting the Constitution. But I think that's that, that would happen anyway, um, that, that that change has already occurred in the court, and she's really going to make folks focus on the text if she is confirmed to the Supreme Court. Okay, Professor, I really appreciate you being back with us. That is Tara Lee Grove. She's professor of law at the University of Alabama. And you can catch more of the Barrett confirmation hearing on the Bloomberg at Live Go. Up next, tax planning for a possible Biden administration from Jir Doyle of BNY Mellon. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. And as you mentioned moments ago, senators are questioning Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett again today. She dodged questions from Democrats about how she would rule on particular issues. Judge Barrett also said she hasn't made any promises to anyone about how she would decide any case. One of those asking questions will be Democratic vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris. 
Members of anti-government groups accused of plotting to kidnap Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer also discussed abducting Virginia's Governor Ralph Northam. FBI Special Agent Richard Trask testified during a court hearing in Michigan today that the groups were unhappy with the lockdown orders the governors issued to contain the coronavirus pandemic. Six men have been charged with plotting to kidnap Governor Whitmer. Seven others face state terrorism charges. Governments across Europe are ratcheting up restrictions in an effort to contain the spread of the coronavirus. The continent has recorded its highest weekly number of new infections since the start of the pandemic. The World Health Organization says there were more than 700,000 new COVID-19 cases reported in Europe last week. That's a jump of 34 percent compared to the previous week. Soccer star Cristiano Ronaldo has tested positive for coronavirus. Ronaldo won't be allowed to play for Portugal's team in a match against Sweden tomorrow. The country's soccer federation says he doesn't have symptoms and is in isolation. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. Presidential candidate Joe Biden has made no secret of his plan to raise taxes on the wealthy if he is elected, using them to pay for some of his big programs, which has some wealthy Americans taking a harder look at their tax planning ahead of this election. Welcome now, Jerry Doyle. He is BNY Mellon at Wealth Management Senior Vice President, where he advises on estate planning strategy. So welcome, Jerry. It's great to have you with us here. First of all, start with why wealthy Americans might want to rush to their T&E lawyer right now to figure out what to do. Well, one of the big problems is that currently there is a very large exemption, $11.58 million for each person in the United States. So you have the ability to give away during lifetime without having to pay any transfer tax, any gift tax, up to $11.5 million. Uh, that $11.5 million exemption is scheduled under current law to revert in the year 2026 to $5 million index for inflation. Now, the, the problem is that if the Democrats hit the trifecta in November, there's a fear that what will happen is that exemption, that is currently $11.58 million, will be reduced to as low as $3.5 million for state tax purposes and possibly as low as $1 million for gift tax purposes. So what we're telling clients is take a look at this now, go to your attorney, and perhaps what you want to do is make some transfers to use this large $11.58 million exemption, all are part of it, before they take it away. So it could be a situation after the November elections where uh, if you don't use this exemption, you're going to lose the exemption. So I want to make sure I understand this. First of all, they'd have to pass a law, presumably, to do this. So it's probably going to be after the first of the year because the new Congress will have to get in place if this happens and President Biden becomes president. Uh, yep. So you've got probably till the end of the year or thereabouts. But if you make a large transfer to your sons and daughters, let's assume for the moment, uh, and you're under this exemption, then you're good no matter how they change the law. Is that right? That's correct. Even if the exemption goes down and you use, let's say you use the whole $11,580,000 $11, exemption, if they change the law and the exemption goes down, they've told us in regulations that were enacted um, in November of last year that they are not going to so-called claw back this exemption. So if you use it, you're good. You're not going to run into a situation where uh, they're going to be able to tax you on the difference between what the reduced exemption is and the current exemption now. So, so, Jerry, help me. I don't know about these things particularly much, but we hear about the very wealthy having various trust arrangements that they can enter into, get generation skipping trusts, things like that. Uh, would those be affected by a Biden administration changing the law? Well, they possibly could. Obviously, you're going to have uh, a potential change in the amount you can give to those trusts if they reduce the exemption. And there's also been talk of, for example, your dynasty trust. Those are designed so that if you transfer assets into that trust, that the trust can last for multiple generations, in, in some cases in perpetuity, depending on the state that you set it up in. And there have been um, some indication that maybe what they might do is limit the duration of those trusts to maybe 50, 60, or 90 years so they can't last in uh, perpetuity. That would bring those assets back in the transfer tax system. What about the stepped-up basis? That's something that's been talked about as well. As I understand it, if you die and you give assets to your heirs, the basis in those assets actually gets stepped up to the value at the time you die. Is that the way it works now? 
that's that's the current law. What happens under the stepped up basis regime is, let's say, I have stock that I bought at ten dollars a share, and it's currently worth fifty dollars a share. If I were to die, the cost basis for income tax purposes would be increased from ten dollars a share to fifty dollars a share, meaning that embedded gain never gets taxed. Now, what uh, Biden would like to do, and the Democrats would like to do is they would like to eliminate the step up in basis so that in my example if i died with that stock that i bought for ten bucks that was currently worth fifty dollars a share at the time of my death my heirs would not only inherit the stock they would get that embedded gain as well their cost basis when they received the stock to me would be ten dollars per share as opposed to fifty bucks a share now we had that's called carryover basis in other words the seed and basis carries over to the ears. We had carryover basis in 1976. It proved to be unworkable, and it was repealed uh, retroactively in 1980. So we've dealt with this before, and um, it, it didn't work out that well. So, so Jerry, uh, the polls, I mean, you can't always believe the polls, goodness knows, but the polls seem to be pointing in the direction that it's quite possible that Joe Biden could get elected November 3rd. And in fact, it's even possible that the Senate could switch over to Republican, which would be important for this purpose, as I understand it. Are you seeing people lined up outside your door and around the doors of trust and estate lawyers and uh, tax accountants around the country? Well, I think that we're, we're trying to tell people that the about these potential changes and things that they might want to do like uh, user exemption now, set up some trust now. And I think the problem is we experienced this, experience this back in 2012 when they were going to reduce the then exemption of $5 million down to $1 million. A lot of people waited till the last minute, and as a result, they found out that the attorneys were too busy to handle their work, draft trust for them. Appraisers were too busy to do an appraisal for difficult-to-value assets. So what we're telling clients is plan now get the documents in place. You don't have to pull the trigger and actually transfer assets to these things, but at least you got the documents in place. Maybe you've got an appraisal in place. That way, if you want to pull the trigger and the law does change, you are got everything in place. You can just do it on a moment's notice. So, Jerry, finally, um, the reason why the former vice president is proposing is not just to be nasty to rich people, as far as I can understand. He needs the money, wants the money for certain programs to invest in, things like infrastructure spending, a lot of things that we agree should be done. Do you think that enough wealthy Americans will flock to their trust and estates lawyers to get this thing fixed so they won't get the revenues he would like to get out of it? I mean, how substantial could this be, the tax uh, structuring? Well, um they, they indicate that um, he wants to use the money, the tax savings, or the tax increases for health care infrastructure, and even to battle climate change. And I think what you're finding is that there is a potential that be a large source of revenue, uh, and they measure this over a 10-year period, to um, cover the cost for some of these programs that he wants to provide for. Hopefully, uh, for our clients, that they, uh, they will engage in some type of planning before the changes happen. I know we're we're um, proactively trying to tell people to take advantage of these changes before they happen so they can save some of their estate and pass it down to their heirs. Jerry, thank you so very much for being with us. Really appreciate it. That's Jerry Doyle. He's Senior Vice President of BNY Mellon Wealth Management. Still ahead this hour, we're going to get to talk to Richard Haas, the President of the Council on Foreign Relations, for his thoughts on how the pandemic has changed foreign policy and much more. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for a check on the markets. Joining us now is Scarlett Fu. So, Scarlett, we got some encouraging bank numbers out, some, some earnings out, but on the other hand, some not so encouraging news about vaccines. It all adds up to a pretty mixed market right now, David. Investors really dialing down their risk appetite. And the broad market taking a breather after the tech-driven rally yesterday set the S&P 500 to a six-week high. If you look at how the different indexes are performing today, tech is extending its outperformance once again. So a bit of a sign of the bid for safety. And that tilt to safety is really reflected across asset classes, not just in equities. We're seeing the U.S. Treasuries uh, move higher as the bond market returns from a long weekend. The dollar is also firmer as well. And of course, as you've been talking about, there's been no movement on stimulus discussions. Libby Cantrell of PIMCO writes that comprehensive stimulus looks very likely dead until January. 
And of course, the macro picture remains pretty challenged as well. The latest data out show inflation remains tame, despite the Fed's best efforts to push prices higher. And the IMF revised its outlook. The global recession will actually be less severe than what it had forecast, but the world faces an uneven recovery until COVID starts receding. So in this new normal, you look at what sectors are outperforming, what sectors are underperforming. The worst three performers in the S&P 500, all cruise ship operators. Royal Caribbean is tapping the financial markets once again to raise a billion dollars in equity and convertible bonds. That'll dilute existing shareholders. And this, of course, as cruise ships in the United States remains docked. Uh, Delta is leading airlines lower after its third quarter results disappointed. It's also delaying $5 billion in jet deliveries because why spend the money? Why splash out on increasing supply when demand still remains pretty low? Yeah, that's so go good for cruise lines. But what about the banks? Because we started out the day here in New York, at least with JP Morgan and Citi, both surprising the upside. And it looks like they're doing pretty well. They were doing pretty well operationally. Uh, certainly a lot of people had expected more loans, uh, excuse me, provisioning for bad loans, but we know they were very aggressive in the first half of the year. They had set aside billions of dollars to cover loans that could go bad. So what we saw this time around was the provisioning slowing down. JP Morgan and Citigroup set aside a combined less than $3 billion. Uh, JP Morgan specifically around 600 million versus the estimated 2.4 billion after setting aside 20 billion in the first half. Peter Cher of Academy Securities say financials in general have been very conservative in their loan loss reserves and having these much lower third quarter uh, provisions could be a catalyst for the sector to finally provide some leadership. And you saw in the trading numbers how well they're doing there. Uh, JP Morgan and Citigroup benefiting from volatile markets. JP Morgan saw a 30% jump in markets revenue. Cities, fixed income, currencies and commodities trading had its best third quarter in eight years. But you look at the stock's performances yeah. today, they're down. Investors are not convinced we've seen the worst when it comes to those bad loans. Yeah, exactly. I mean, looking at the stock price, actually, I was surprised that they're not getting much credit for those results they announced today. And we still got some more financials coming. We still have more financials coming. By the end of the week, all six banks will have reported. I would expect to see more of the same trends, right? Trading doing well and loan loss provisioning going down quite a bit with most of the hard work done in the first half of the year. Looking forward, of course, we're going to expect a lot of uh, interesting numbers out of the tech sector because healthcare and tech were the only two sectors in the S&P 500 to have post surprises and growth in both the top line and bottom line last quarter. David? Scarlett, thank you so very much. That's Scarlett Fu reporting on the markets. Coming up here, we're going to get to speak to Richard Haas. He is president of the Council on Foreign Relations. They have a big new task force report out on the pandemic and its effect globally. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says President Trump's latest stimulus proposal falls short of what's needed to shore up the economic recovery and battle the coronavirus pandemic. In a letter to her Democratic colleagues today, the Speaker said significant changes must be made to remedy what she says are deficiencies in the President's plan. Speaker Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin negotiated over the weekend on the administration's new $1.8 trillion proposal. No new talks have been announced. A second government official is complaining that he did not consent to being used in a campaign ad for President Trump. After facing criticism for using Dr. Anthony Fauci in an ad, the Trump campaign is running an online ad that shows Joint Chiefs Chairman General Mark Milley and Vice President Mike Pence in the Situation Room. The ad copy says, quote, President Trump wants you to, wants you to request your ballot. Politico is reporting the campaign didn't get Milley's permission to use his image. The military has strict rules about uniformed service members in political advertising. The future of the Iran nuclear deal may hang on the election, but not just the one in the United States. Iranians will elect a new president next June, ending the era of Hassan Rouhani, who staked his career on clinching the historic nuclear deal with world powers back in 2015. Experts say a new leader may have little incentive to formally abandon an accord that could give Iran's devastated economy a lifeline, but may, but may not return to the table on the same terms as before. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts 
in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks very much, Mark. The pandemic of 2020 is without a doubt the biggest economic and public health story of the year, the decade, and maybe even of the century. But it's also a global and national security story. The Council on Foreign Relations convened an independent task force to look at what happened and what we need to do to prepare for the next one. Welcome now the president of the council, Ambassador Richard Haas. So, Richard, thank you so much for being with us. Fascinating task force report. It was pretty damning, I would say at least, what the globe did and particularly what the United States did. Where did we go wrong? Well, it's a, long, it's a long list where we in the world went, went wrong. Neither the world nor the United States had made this a priority. If we had, we would have predicted it. And if we had, we would have been much more prepared for it. So there's that. Clearly, the World Health Organization dropped the ball, as did China. But I still think the report correctly says that the bulk of the responsibility for what's gone wrong in this country was on us. Once it got here, very little of the death toll and the economic consequences uh, were, were inevitable. And it's, it's our lack of organization, our lack of clear messaging, our lack of masks, a lack of having made testing a national priority. It's, it's a long list, David. And one of the things that struck me in the report, Richard, is you might say, well, the last time we had this was 100 years ago, so we've got like 100 years to get ready. That's not what the report says. It says it's inevitable and even says it may be imminent to have another pandemic. Right. This was COVID-19 because it was first discovered in 2019. There'll be a COVID-21 or 23 or 25. God forbid there may be also at some point bacteria that emerge that are resistant to, uh, to antibiotics. This is what globalization is all about. Localization means nothing anymore. There's too many highways where, in this case, infectious uh, disease travels around the world at, at enormous velocity. We just have to assume it will happen again. It could happen regularly, and we've just got to be prepared for it like we would against any other threat. So give us a checklist. I know it's a long checklist, but the, the high points here. For the United States, what do we need to do here that we have not done? We need to create a national uh, organizing person, so somewhere in the, in the executive branch. There's got to be a clear person uh, who's in, in charge of preparing for this and coordinating, essentially a czar for this sort of thing. We have to clarify the responsibilities, the federal government versus states versus uh, cities. We need to have an ongoing testing program. So if and when there are infection breakouts, we don't have this long uh, lead time in order to, to catch up. We also, quite honestly, there's some things you can't legislate, having a president who would send a consistent message about the importance of taking this seriously, about wearing masks. Uh, that's also essential. Richard, as you say, it's a global phenomenon in a globalized world. I mean, uh, germs and viruses don't know borders as a practical matter. What do we need to do globally? You've uh, said what we think we need to do for the United States. What do we need to do internationally? Well, the, the leading international mechanism is the World Health Organization. It's imperfect. It always will be because great powers will push back. Still, the U.S. should be in it. We should be in it trying to, trying to uh, reform it. We probably need uh, some type of an organization out there that's more independent, that can basically blow the whistle on countries that, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, are not taking the steps they should be taking so they're better prepared, almost a global rating system. And then we need uh, someone to blow the whistle if and when an infection breaks out to look at what countries are doing. We need essentially much more transparency and, mon transparency and monitoring and if the World Health Organization won't do it, then we need to set up something more independent. Well, do you uh, kind of, kind of, sort of agree with President Trump on that? He's been very critical of China and has been critical of WHO for not blowing the whistle. In your task force report, you do say China didn't measure up. Oh, clearly. China did not, it did not meet its international obligations for the first, what, six weeks or so. The World Health Organization deferred to China in ways it should not have. All that's true, but still... Yeah, the, the virus arrived. There's a difference between an outbreak and a pandemic. There's a difference between a pandemic when 20,000 people die and 200,000 die. You know, at the end of the day, David, we're still what? Four and a half percent of the world's population. And why are we over 20 percent of the world's deaths? There is something wrong. And that's not on China. That's not on the World Health Organization. That's on us. We've got to own up to that and we've got to learn from it. We have, as you know so well, an election coming up, uh, and you've written extensively. <laughs> so on, I've heard. Yeah, yeah, you've written extensively <laughs> on President Trump's uh, foreign policy: the good, the bad, the ugly, if I can put it that way. Uh, let's talk about the possibility, at least now. I think we have to talk about a possible uh, Biden presidency. How would, for example, President Biden handle preparation for a pandemic differently, as far as we know? 
Well, my guess is he would make it a much higher priority. This is consistent with what previous uh, Democratic, and also in, in the case of George W. Bush, Republican administrations do. I think he'd, he'd make it a higher priority. He clearly rejoined the World uh, Health Organization. He would require the use of masks on all federal property. He would try to incentivize, one way or another, governors and mayors to insist on masking and social distancing. Uh, I think he'd probably put more money into a uh, into a national testing effort. So I think you'd see much more nationally led effort. So more broadly, talk about what a Biden foreign policy might look like in contrast with President Trump. Some things they may not really disagree fundamentally on, such as being tougher with China on trade. Where do you think they would have the biggest differences that would make a difference? I think you're right about China. I think either way, it's going to be a very difficult relationship. Probably the biggest difference, uh, I'd say two, one is a much greater willingness to work with allies. I think the instinct, the, the default option of a Biden administration would be to look for partners and allies in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere to see if we can't meet local or global challenges together. Second of all, you're not, you wouldn't hear about America first. You'd hear about multilateralism. You would basically begin foreign policy with the recognition that the United States can't do anything better alone than it could do with others. So I think you'd have the United States much more involved in the world with allies in international arrangements. Multilateralism would no longer be a dirty word. Uh, it, did, does President Trump deserve some credit for what's happened in the Middle East? I mean, he did what was against all the conventional wisdom, moving the embassy, uh, taking out Soleimani, things like that. Right now, it looks like he's had some success. Would a Biden build on that? Well, again, I think he's, the biggest success is the normalization of relations between the UAE and Bahrain and Israel. That's a welcome thing. But let's keep it in perspective. Overall, in the Middle East, there's been no progress on the Palestinian issue. If anything, resolution is farther away. You have multiple failed states in Syria, Yemen, Libya, and Iran is today closer to a nuclear weapon than it was three and a half years ago. So overall, I wouldn't call that progress, but I do think the one bit of progress was this growing normalization between Israel and several of the Arab states. Richard, you've had positions at the National Security Council and the White House, also in the State Department, of really teeing up for the principles what the issues are they need to deal with the priorities. Do it for a new President Biden if it comes to pass. What do you put at the top of the list in terms of foreign relations, what he has to address? Uh, I'd say probably two or three things, David. One would be uh, stabilizing the U.S.-China and U.S.-Russian relationships. Great power relations still, if you look at history, drive an awful lot of it. And secondly, we've got to try to narrow some of the gaps between global challenges and global responses, whether you're dealing with health or you're dealing with cyber or obviously with, with climate change. Uh, and I think also we've got to make a better case to the American people about even while we have to focus on our internal challenges, we can't become isolationists. We can't ignore the world. If we do so, is at our peril. But I think you've got to sell that. I think the, the Oval Office has to once again become something of a classroom to make Americans understand why the world matters and to, to generate some support for America's involvement in the world. Richard, interesting. You didn't mention Iran or North Korea. Well, proliferation is a big deal, I think, in, in North Korea and Iran. One, you have North Korea, you've got nuclear weapons and missiles. It keeps advancing. They're farther along than they were three and a half years ago. I don't think you're going to give, get them to denuclearize. The question is, can you limit or even reduce the threat? And with Iran, you've got to prevent them from getting uh, nuclear weapons. But we're, we're not going to have regime change there. We've got to have diplomacy. And that's what's missing from both Iran and North Korea is serious diplomacy, what in our generation, David, we called arms control. Mm -hmm. I think we have to have serious conversations, negotiations with both countries. We need a good ambassador, Richard. You volunteering? <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, David. <laughs> Thanks so much to Richard Haas. He's Council on Foreign Relations president. Coming up, our Swing State series leading up to the election focuses on Florida this week. We talk with a candidate for Congress in a key district, Democrat Alan Cohn. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Each week, we're taking a look at one of the key swing states in the run-up to the election. And this week, it is the crucial, I mean crucial, state of Florida. To set the stage for us, we welcome now Bloomberg Miami Bureau Chief Jonathan Levin. So, Jonathan, welcome. Great to have you set this up for us. Give us your sense of Florida politically in this election year. Where is it inclined to go? 
Hey, David. This is going to be a super interesting uh, year, as you say. We're essentially looking at a couple of uh, key issues here. One of them uh, is older voters, right? Uh, my colleague, Josh Green, has a great story on the terminal this morning uh, about this, this matter. Um, you know, the 65 and older population was key for Trump in 2016. This year, there's a distinct possibility that they could go for Biden. And my colleague, Josh, in his story this morning, looks at, uh, at, at how turnout among that uh, 65 and older group with the mail-in votes uh, is really starting to look pretty favorable for Biden if, in fact, that, that, uh, that trend uh, in, in the polls holds. So one of the things that many of us remember, some of us have scars from it, is 2000 in Florida, how critical it was and how messy, I think I can use that term, the vote count was. What's it going to look like this time when we believe there are going to be a lot more absentee ballots, right? That's absolutely right. You know, um, it, it really all is going to depend on on margins. If uh, if Biden can can run away with this uh, with this thing and win big in a place like uh, like Florida, you know, we might actually know who the the president of the United States is going to be on November third. If not, if it if it's extremely close, whew, we're we're in for a long week. I think. Yeah, I hope it's just a week. That'd be good. Okay, thank you so much to Bloomberg Miami Bureau Chief Jonathan Levin. Staying with that swing state of Florida, we turn now to the Democratic candidate in what may prove to be a key congressional race this year. Award-winning TV investigative reporter Alan Cohn is running for a second time for the seat in the 15th District, which includes the area between Orlando and Tampa along the important I-4 corridor. And we welcome now to Bloomberg. So, Alan, thank you so much for joining us. Give us a sense of your race, your district. Well, the, the, the good news for us is that a new poll came out just yesterday showing that we are in a statistical tie in the presidential race. It is also a statistical tie. As you mentioned, I-4 is always plays a pivotal role because it's become a bellwether. Whatever party dominates usually takes the state. What's incredible this year is that it's taken on some national significance with all the discussion about whether or not there will be games played with the election and it what we would think is impossible, but we've seen a lot of impossible things the last four years. If the uh, presidential race winds up in the House, uh, it is settled not by majority, but by congressional delegation majority. And right now, Florida has one more Republican than Democrat. If I win, that flips to a Democratic majority. And uh, some of the television networks uh, have said that this race is actually the most important congressional campaign in the country because it could have an impact on the presidential race. No, exactly. I've seen that, saying that this is actually determined the presidency as a practical matter. T take us inside your district. Give us a sense of it. I think it's something It's heavily Caucasian, white, as I understand it. What's the age demographic? What are the voters concerned about? Well, you were just talking about the 65 and older uh, voter. 20, over 25 percent of this district is uh, are voters 25 or older. And, and incredibly, I'm running against a guy who is talking about ending Social Security and, and gambling it in the stock market, which is not going to be playing well uh, with the voters in this district. It's a suburban district. It's a, a middle class working family district. And, and that is why I'm running, because my wife and I, uh, we have lived the ups and downs of, of this economy uh, where, you know, the cost of living is, is going up quicker than uh, middle class salaries and where even if you have health care through your employer or the affordable Care Act, you could hardly afford to use it because the deductibles are so high. Those are the issues that keep people in this congressional district up at night, and they want to see uh, somebody who will focus in on saying, I, you know, we want to do our part uh, to to change these things, and, and and that's why, frankly, my opponent is is rather out of touch. He's a, a multi-millionaire uh, self-funding candidate uh, who has never had to worry about these mundane issues. Well, a multimillionaire or a billionaire self-funding candidate named Donald Trump one last time. And his basic pitch, as I understand it, on the economy is, look, it was going gangbusters before the pandemic hit. It's not my fault the pandemic hit. Is that resonating with your voters, your constituents down there in the 15th district? No, it's not, because people in this district, uh, no matter whether they're Democrats or Republicans or independents, are tired of the chaos that we have seen the last four years. 
They're tired of it, and it's not just the language. It's the fact that people are sick and they're dying because of this pandemic. They're out of work or underemployed because of this pandemic, and, and the problems with the economy started long before this. So uh, people are, are looking for a return to normalcy, and, and I, I believe that's what Joe brought Biden uh, brings to the table. Talk to me about money, the role of money in your race, but in general in Florida as well. There's been a lot of money pouring into that state, as I understand it. Yeah, you know what? Um, as you mentioned, I'm an investigative reporter. I also anchored the news uh, for the last four years. And I had an opportunity uh, during that time to talk to Democrats and Republicans. And I know that Republicans raise money uh, differently for these races than de Democrats do. They get large pack checks. Uh, they get a lot of corporate money. Democrats don't. Um, you know, I sit here uh, calling sometimes 12 to 1400 people a day uh, and getting small donations, getting large donations uh, from people who could afford it, people who want uh, to end this chaos over the last four years. Uh, and look, the, the Democrats have been uh, targeting this seat for two years because the incumbent uh, who was defeated in the primary is under criminal investigation, uh, but also this district has been trending Democrat. There have been uh, thousands of, of, of people who have moved into uh, this congressional district. There's a lot of new home construction, and the district has been uh, steadily trending Democrat. And so um, this district is a lot different than it has been in years past, and, and it's a reason why it is on the, 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 the map now in terms of national politics. Well, it's very interesting you raise that, Alan, because we've seen that some other places as well. Maricopa County out in Arizona, down in North Carolina, we've, we've talked to candidates who Look, it's a different district than it was four, eight years ago. How many of voters who will be voting on November 3rd weren't even living there four years ago, eight years ago? Well, you know, there's, an old, there's a saying in Florida is that most voters are from someplace else. And uh, in, in this uh, this congressional district, there are a lot of people from the Midwest and the Northeast and uh, and other parts of the country because it's such a wonderful place to, to, to live. And, and so you see in the, the more suburban areas of the country a, a lot of home building going on uh, and people commuting into Tampa or commuting into or Orlando. Uh, it is the I-4 corridor, so there's a lot of commuting in between. It's also a heavily agricultural area. This is where your strawberries come from. Uh, this is where your citrus crop uh, comes from. Uh, and uh, those, you know, folks, uh, they've had it uh, really tough uh, over the last, uh, you know, few years because of climate change, I and mean, it's more difficult for, for growers to, to irrigate their, their crops. It's, uh, immigration is a huge issue because strawberry growers don't have enough uh, help in terms of picking their crop. Uh, so that is, that is basically the demographic in, in the, the, you know, of, of the district. So, Alan, finally, give us your best guess, and I ask that because it's going to be an informed guess, certainly more informed than mine would be, about how late we're going to have to stay up. Uh, election night, or maybe beyond that, to know the results in Florida and in your race? Well, I, from my experience in our primary, we knew within an hour. Um, mm -hmm. Vote by mail is crucial here. I, you know, we had the results in an hour. Um, the, the vote by mail uh, really kind of gave us an early indication where, where the primary was going to go. We believe that's going to be the case on, on election night. Uh, and vote by mail absolutely outpaced both early voting and election day voting. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of people uh, who are, you know, because of the pandemic, are, are less likely to go and vote on election day. We want people to be safe. And the safest thing to do right now is to, to get your uh, ballot in the mail as soon as possible. That's the one thing we hear from every single person we talk with. Thank you so much, Alan. Really great to talk with you. Alan Cohn, he's Democratic candidate for Florida's 15th congressional district. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We want to get one more check on the markets. And joining us now is Abigail Doolittle. It looks like a rather mixed day still. Indeed, David. Small moves, mixed moves. The S&P 500 and the Dow down slightly. The tech of Nasdaq up slightly. Yesterday was all about technology tech cooling off just a little bit today. Today, it's all about the banks because, of course, earnings season for the third quarter has kicked off uh, fully. And we have the banks down sharply uh, on this. Citigroup in particular down 4%. Both JP Morgan and Citigroup beat 
estimates, but Citigroup warning about the slowness of the economy. Costs a little bit higher there. Plus, on this uncertain environment, bonds are higher. Uh, that means yields are lower. That's weighing on the financials. Now, it's also interesting, David, because we do have some movement in the healthcare sector. The reason the NASDAQ is higher, this has to do with biotech. As Pfizer, of course, reported, they put up a solid report, but they are halting uh, their study for the COVID-19 vaccine due to an unexpected, unexplained illness in one of uh, the patients. And as a result, we have some of the competitors, such as Moderna and Novavax popping higher, but overall not a lot happening today. Keep in mind though, David, again, bonds slightly higher, so that tells you investors uh, are a little bit uncertain, hedging for uh, what could be next, the unknown. Anything seems possible this year. I think that's fair. <laughs> Anything's possible in 2020. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're gonna talk with Mark Chenoweth. He's new Civil Liberties Alliance Executive Director on the Amy Coney Barrett now confirmation hearing. This is Bounce of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.